Welcome to Confronting Today's Reality of Totalitarian States, Deterrence, and Dependency. Please welcome Dr. Niall Gardner, Director of the Heritage Foundation's Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom and Bernard and Barbara Lomas Fellow. I guess watching in uh, in London online uh, and I'm delighted to uh, introduce a long-standing friend of heritage uh, the right honorable Sir Ian Duncan Smith MP uh, we've been privileged to host Ian here in Washington on several occasions over the past uh, two decades and we're grateful to have him return today to the United States uh, Sir Ian Duncan Smith was the UK Secretary of State for work and pensions from May 2010 until March 2016 uh, he was elected Conservative MP for Chingford and Woodford Green in April 1992. Uh, Sir Ian served as Shadow Secretary of State for Social Security from 1997 to 1999 and Shadow Secretary of State for Defence from 1999 to 2001, after which he was Leader of the Opposition from 2001 to 2003. Uh, Sir Ian is the founder and UK co-chair of the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, uh, which has brought together legislators from across 23 countries in the free world, from the US to Japan, to work to reform how democratic countries approach China. I should note uh, that he has been officially sanctioned by the Chinese Communist Party, which is a real badge of honor. Uh, Sir Ian Duncan Smith is a man of tremendous principle, a conservative in the tradition of Margaret Thatcher, who cares passionately about his country, the defense of individual liberty, and the future of the Anglo-American Alliance. Uh, Sir Ian is a conviction politician, as Lady Thatcher uh, would have said, who has dedicated his life to public service. We are delighted and honored to have Ian back at Heritage Talk to us today. Thank you very much. Uh, now, <clears throat> thank you very much indeed for uh, that kind of introduction, particularly the reference to being sanctioned uh, by the Chinese government. Hardly a day goes by uh, that the Chinese embassy uh, tries to remind me of that, uh, which is uh, always a badge of honor, as you say. <clears throat> the point is, really, this speech is about uh, an end to what I consider the original end uh, of the idea that we have uh, moved on from totalitarianism. Uh, we haven't at all. So the end of history, we are now at the end of the end of history, which is probably a good thing. Just 38 days ago, the world was convulsed when Russia invaded that independent nation, uh, nation of Ukraine. The shockwaves of that invasion have traveled around the world. And even today, as we look at our telephones and videos, uh, we learn of the horrific war crime, and I say war crime without hesitation, that has taken place in Bucha. The pictures of civilians tied and executed uh, by uh, the Russian forces as they withdrew, this gives us a glimpse into Putin's world. It has smashed our own perception of what the modern world was and forced nations, I believe, across Europe and North America to completely rethink what I considered to be the rather arrogant assumptions politicians made when the Cold War ended. The lazy and convenient assumption made too readily was that democracy had won, <clears throat> and in so doing, had proved that it was a natural state of being. In 1989, Francis Fukuyama suggested that liberalism had triumphed over fascism and communism. In short, that there were no longer any ideological competitors for liberal democracy and the free market. Well, if that was the case, then why in the intervening years have we seen so many nations turn their backs on democracy uh, in favor of the exact opposite? That proposition led to the mis misplaced idea that once exposed to the free market, it would inevitably follow that capitalism would do the rest. In fact, I recall just such a discussion in the government in the UK with which I was a cabinet member, which Niles has referenced. The government then decided to make huge play to get closer to the People's Republic of China, both diplomatically and, of course, in trade and investment after the years of 2010. This was referred to, I think, by George Osborne as the golden decade. I preferred to refer to it 
instead as Project Kowtow, which I have to tell you I think has turned out to be a much more rational description. Far from becoming more democratic, believers in human rights and the rule of law, President Xi's China has gone on in the opposite direction, as has Putin's Russia. In truth, the balance of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law are delicate flowers. They need constant attention, and most of all, the determination to fight to uphold them. All of us, particularly the European countries, were incredibly quick to take what they called the peace dividend, and the assumption that there would be no more European conflict was held as an inalienable truth. The problem is that we have wanted to engage with dictatorial and despotic regimes on the basis that somehow opening up the free market would lead inevitably to the growth of those corresponding internal freedoms. Nothing exemplified this more than Mrs. Merkel's determination to forge a strong relationship with Russia, at one and the same time satisfying Germany's internal market needs and helping to ensure Russian cooperated with the West. So great was her belief in this <clears throat> that she went ahead and built a direct pipeline from Russia, Nord Stream 2, ensuring Germany's energy needs. In so doing, of course, she simply ignored the legitimate fears of her neighbours and allies in Eastern Europe. Their uh, concerns that this pipeline would enable Putin to bully them when necessary by cutting off their gas. In this desperate pursuit of her modern detente and energy needs, that which didn't fit with that view simply was ignored. So when Russia sank further and further into autocracy, opening, op openly using cyber warfare to disrupt and interfere into Western countries and even invading Georgia, still this path of hers was grimly pursued. The result was enormous dependency on Russian gas and oil, whilst Russia grew in strength and determination to then grow its own spheres of influence. Germany was not alone, I'm sad to say, as corrupt Russian money flowed into our own markets, here and in London. Governments turned a blind eye. There was little of any censure or sanction on the oligarchs who flaunted their ill-gotten gains in, in plain sight. Worse, as they entertained politicians, they even used our courts to silence their critics. Then the Skripals were poisoned in Salisbury using military-grade nerve gas as part of Putin's warning to those oligarchs uh, to look after his 200 billion corruptly stashed away money. Yes, nations then came together to sanction Russia, but it was pretty thin gruel on our part, collectively and soon forgotten. Even the brutal crushing of Syrian dissent by the Russians received little sanction other than words. Western weakness and division was one of the early lessons that Putin has learned. The truth is that we had so readily forgotten the lessons that we learned the hard way during the Cold War. When Russia invaded Georgia, the West did little. When Russia invaded Crimea and instigated insurrection in the Donbass, we didn't crack down on Russia as we should have had. Instead, Ukraine, in what I think of as a sad betrayal, redolent of the 1938 Munich sellout of Czechoslovakia, was persuaded by France and Germany to sign up to the Minsk agreements. Such an ignominious settlement that left Russia in Crimea and in the Donbass and the Ukraine to lick its wounds. Putin was encouraged yet again. It wasn't always like this. How different things were in the early 80s when the Soviet Union confronted NATO by placing SS-20 theater nuclear missiles in Eastern Europe. Then three strong leaders stepped up and acted. Reagan and Thatcher together, and then Helmut Kohl, deployed Cruz and Pershing against enormous public discontent. This action drove the Soviet Union back to the negotiating table, eventually leading to the withdrawal of all the theater nuclear weapons. There was no doubting for Soviet Union the West resolve. However, since the ending of the Cold War, there has been every reason to doubt the West resolve on almost every occasion. In the UK, we're now remembering 40 years ago, after the Falklands were invaded, and Margaret Thatcher's grim determination to drive those invaders out. Her meaning and her reason was simply on this very fine basis. 
that aggression should never be tolerated or rewarded. And on that, she was right, and she won. Whether we like it or not, we are still in an ideological contest between totalitarianism and democracy, not having won, but still facing them up. For some time, I've been warning the West that you have failed to understand that President Xi in China is under also no illusions about this conflict. He has made it abundantly clear that he sees his form of government, single-party autocracy, as the natural form of government, and his leading role in establishing this is important. For him, democracy is a passing phase in global history. The free market hasn't distracted him at all. If anything, he has tightened up on the nature of his government and ensured the full pursuit of his own political goals. As Western businesses rushed to do business, we as politicians looked away from those inc inconvenient truths. Now the second biggest economy, Xi is determined China will overtake the USA, and he then plans that it should happen militarily as well. These are not just the heightened views of someone that China has sanctioned, but Xi's very own off-stated views. When China took over Tibet and put hundreds of thousands of Tibetans in forced labor camps, what did we collectively do? When China illegally occupied the South China Seas and militarized it, what did we collectively do? Since then, China has carried out genocide and forced labor on the Uyghur, trashed the International Sino-British Treaty on Hong Kong, and is even now arresting and persecuting peaceful democracy campaigners. If European countries are dependent on Russia for energy, which they are, just have a look at how dependent the whole developed world is now on China. From plastic pots to the computer I type this speech on. From the batteries in electric cars driving around outside to the electric cars themselves. If that wasn't enough, the West has calmly watched idly as China has snapped up over 80% of the rare earth material mines. And now they have the biggest production facility for rare earth materials in the world. These, I must remind you, are critical to our modern world and the way we live our lives. Without these materials, batteries, computers and mobile phones simply cannot be produced. These are the oil of the 21st century. China has us, in effect, on the end of an economic string. The point is, we did that. We did that, the West. We have ensured that one of the world's most despotic regimes is about to become the wealthiest. Small wonder then, after the huge show of chaotic weakness that was our retreat from Kabul, President Xi's government has stepped up the threats on Taiwan, as they very quickly told Taiwan after the Afghanistan debacle. The USA and the rest of NATO won't save Taiwan. Oh, yes. And don't forget the new Sino-Russian friendship between the two states has no limit agreement. Given all of that, imagine how astonished I was to hear that commentators were speaking about the role of China as an interlocutor on Ukraine. China? Really? China's abstentions at the UN and its organization of its Belt and Road project and how they managed debtor nations to do the same in the UN, should sorely have put that to bed. Doesn't anyone remember their history? That they remember Lord Halifax in 1940, demanding that Churchill ask Mussolini to become the interlocutor with Herr Hitler? The UK, as a result of Boris Johnson's early commitment to the struggle, has had a huge influence, I believe, on this present state of Ukrainian resistance to the Russian invasion. After all, we did the right thing, I believe, and put troops in to train the Ukrainian forces since 2014, and also to arm them with the US. I am deeply proud of that. It was the right thing to do. The UK and the US Joint Intelligence got it right as well when they called the invasion and have supported the Ukraine with critical intelligence throughout. Importantly, in recent visit to the Baltic area, I had I met one of the Baltic Prime Ministers, and they told me that when the UK left the EU, 
they were all sorry <coughs> because they thought that they had lost a friend. But then when Russia invaded the Ukraine, they rejoiced that the UK had left. That was because they saw the UK didn't have to wait for agreement with the rest of the EU and immediately started imposing and leading the way on significant sanctions. The UK since, they, he, this particular individual commented, had been at the forefront of that process, building trust between our nations. With the USA as well, we have continued to help these brave peoples in Ukraine in providing the most sophisticated weaponry. As Churchill said to Roosevelt in 1941, give us the tools and we will finish the job. Whatever else happens in Ukraine, Ukraine must not now be left in the position where they are perceived to have lost this war. They must win and we must help them do it. What defines winning the war is much more difficult, but they mustn't now be allowed to lose. Sadly, I suspect, as Putin heads east, it will become a much more protracted process, a war of attrition. But we, both America and the UK, must lead the way and stay the course. Sanctions have been bold and will progressively have an effect on Putin and the Russian people. However, I worry about two things. First, whilst Germany and others in Europe continue to take Putin's gas and oil, his war will be financed. This is evidenced by the bounce back of the ruble recently to where it was at the start of the conflict against the dollar. They aren't suffering that much, and the oil and gas proceeds help them enormously. We're all going to be sorely tested over the next few months by the cost of living crisis, which I'm certain uh, will test us all. These are difficult moments for the Alliance and for the West, but they are moments that shape us and define us in the way that we respond to them. And as we have those debates, we forget too easily some of the lessons of history. I recall that when in Moldavia and Wallachia in the late 19th century, Prime Minister Gladstone was confronted with why we should take action or support an, a country so far away. And he responded for the principle that there is no greater bulwark against tyranny than the breasts of free men. We see that today in Ukraine. It is shameful, but also at the same time inspiring. And we are left with a very simple conclusion as we fight out those debates. It is not Russia's invasion of Ukraine alone that is the issue here. It is the wider perspective of the reality of the growth of the axis of totalitarian states. This is the bigger picture we need to focus on. And in so doing, as we think about increased defense spending, which we must, we should remember that very simple phrase, civis pacem, parabellum. Thank you. Three, and thank you, thank you very much for those um, extremely robust uh, remarks and a reminder of the, uh, the importance of uh, the United States and the United Kingdom standing together uh, as leaders of the, the free world in the face of, of the rising threats posed by the likes of China and Russia, the enemies of, of freedom. Uh, and, mm. and so, Ian... Um, a number of uh, questions for you on, on a wide range of foreign policy uh, issues uh, that, that we're facing uh, here today. Um, firstly, uh, I'd like to um, discuss the, the situation in Ukraine, and you very eloquently talked about what is at stake with regard to uh, the, the monstrous and, and barbaric Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. Uh, and, and you referenced the you know, the, the horrors, the atrocities that we are witnessing at this, at this time. And we've seen the pictures coming from, uh, from Busha, just outside of uh, Kiev, uh, scenes of absolute uh, horror, the likes of which we have not witnessed on European soil, certainly since Srebrenica in the mid-1990s, and certainly not since the days of World War II. Uh, British leadership has been uh, absolutely outstanding, I think, on the on the Ukraine uh, crisis. And as you pointed out, Britain has been able to act with 
increased flexibility now that it's outside of the European Union. It's no longer tied down by uh, EU policy. It is free to the shackles of, of EU uh, supranationalism. Could you talk a bit further about British leadership in, in the Brexit era and how important it is, especially in terms of standing up to both, uh, both Russia and, and China? And also, the, uh, if you could address the, you know, this renewed sense of freedom that Britain has now outside of the, the European Union and how that is going to shape and impact British policy in the coming years. Yes, I, the comments I made weren't aimed at uh, sniping, <laughs> aimed at uh, the EU. There, I think uh, the EU um, uh, can work and has its adherence, and it's quite right, and we need to work closely with it uh, over the next coming years. But the point I was trying to make here was that the UK, in a way, uh, has now been released to be able to pursue what it considers to be its particular priorities, which will overlap with those of other countries in Europe, but not always be exactly the same. Uh, the point that was being made to me by that particular Prime Minister was that the allowed the UK, instead of having to go deep into discussion about what to do, the UK acted very quickly on sanctions. And in so doing, I hope and believe, actually, it piled pressure on the others to follow suit quickly. As we saw, that took a little bit of time as early sanctions were brought forward and then further ones, particularly the access to the SWIFT system, which was heavily re resisted. I understand the financial reasons for that, but it was the UK, the USA, uh, uh, leading the way on this. And this is quite important, but the UK was first in that, and that was quite right. And as a result of that, I think those sanctions now are bigger than we've ever seen and will begin to bite uh, on the Russian economy. My worry is, of course, that there are individual problems within Europe because of the dependence on Russian gas and oil, and uh, these are still being pumped in to Europe, and I understand the consequences if these are cut off for them, but it does mean that the money still flows uh, to President Putin, and his access to the Chinese equivalent of the SWIFT banking system helps him enormously. But the point I was making with the rubles rise back up to where it was before, you can see straight away that the sense of the markets understand that actually this is a very big backdoor for Putin. The UK, therefore, has a, a responsibility in helping lead. We are a global player. Uh, and I think the important bit, which I say time and again, is that the critical bit that is important for both the UK and the USA to recognize is that I honestly think history uh, relates constantly that in the modern world, when the UK and the USA are together on a project, when they, uh, when they are together in defense of freedom, then the world is a safer place. When we've been divided over the period since the Second World War over whatever it is, I think it's led to significant problems. And I think, therefore, this is, should be a tent, as it is uh, in the UK. And I think it should be here, too. I don't mean to lecture America on how it should behave. But the truth was, when these things suddenly, the balloon goes up, as we used to say, um, the UK is almost invariably likely to be there as the immediate uh, more likely ally, because we share quite a lot of our immediate responses to these things. Uh, and you can see that in the way that we both settle very easily and very quickly on what defines freedom. Uh, and to that extent, I think the UK now will should have an enhanced role. And in terms of um, what more can be done in supporting uh, the very courageous Ukrainians as they uh, push back the Russian invasion, and in fact, uh, victory for Ukraine over over the Russian invaders is now a, a, a realistic possibility. Mm. Um, in terms of uh, you know, British support for for Ukraine, what more do you expect that the UK will be doing in the coming in the coming weeks? Of course, it's already played a you know a front line role in terms of uh, supporting Ukraine in sending some of the latest uh, defensive weaponry, which has been highly effective against the Russians. But uh, in terms of uh, further action on the British side, what, what do you see happening in terms of British support? Well, I think the British have been phenomenally supportive already. So intelligence, uh, the interesting thing from 2014 onwards with the British training, and I understand the Americans were also involved, um, the, uh, the, the training they've received changed the whole mentality of their fighting force. Uh, what I think <clears throat> they learned was instead of the old <clears throat> Soviet era, uh, era idea of these great tank armies confronting each other, 
they learned very quickly that you disable those processes, those, um, those columns, and you bog them down, and then they become almost a problem to their, to their own army. And so all of that process with the right weaponry has worked. So it's not just the weaponry, it's the understanding how to use it, it's then the teaching of people uh, <coughs> to use those weapons, and then it's the constant supply. And to this extent, I know that uh, America and the U UK have provided them with thousands and thousands of these anti-tank weapons. The Americans are Javelin, ours with the Enlaws, which is the similar equivalent, <coughs> slightly shorter range, but no less Effective, and now I see the UK has provided them with the ground-to-air missile system, which we've already got televisual evidence of how effective that is becoming. So all of this has meant they've been able to hold the line in many cases, tragic and appalling and brutal as the Russian attempts at taking places like Mariupol have turned out to be. And as we say in Bucha, you suddenly discover the brutality of the Russians once they were there. All of that is vitally important, but we have to go on. If I'm going to posit one genuine criticism. I really don't myself understand what the difference is providing somebody with a ground-to-air missile system or providing them with, uh, with Soviet-era jets to be able to defend themselves. I mean, I cannot understand what the logic of that is. And I think that one wasn't handled well. And I think there needs to be a rethink about this. Zelensky has rightly asked for this, which would allow him to take the fight much more aggressively uh, to the Russians, um, and I think that would also have a big effect. So I think we re need to rethink what we define as uh, weaponry that is okay to give them and weaponry that is not. These things are marginal indifference, but absolutely critical in effect. And so I would suggest that, uh, if I can, the U.S. government should rethink their position on this. The Poles, I understand, are still determined that they would like to send these uh, jets, and I think we should assist them as well in the U.K., uh, and they'll have to be trained to use them. So all of that needs to happen. But I think there should, we now recognize that President Putin must lose this war. It's as simple as that. Uh, any attempt by uh, France and others to kind of negotiate some kind of interim peace, much as I, you know, we all want peace, it's in the hands of President Zelensky. I've heard a lot of loose talk at the moment <clears throat> about how we must provide Russia with a, an off-ramp. I don't know if you hear that phrase used over here. I hate that phrase. How do we have the right to tell the, the Ukrainians who are fighting and dying for freedom that we will provide an off-ramp for the Russians? Shame on us. We have no right to say that. We shouldn't. It's kind of lazy, idle, pompous talk that happens uh, when uh, people who aren't engaged in the conflict think they can somehow resolve it. They are losing their lives to fight for freedom, it is them to decide when that freedom is achieved and what, therefore, the price of that is, not for us. Our sole duty is to represent them, present their weapons to them, and defend them as best we can. That's the only thing we're here to do. Uh, very well said, uh, Sarian. And, um, you know, surely we prov should provide the Russians with an off-ramp to defeat, basically. Yeah. That's the only off-ramp that they deserve. Uh, and uh, the, the Poles... Uh, I think came out with some very strong condemnation today of Emmanuel Macron's approach, uh, and uh, you know they they were talking <coughs> about um, you know Macron basically uh, you know sitting down negotiating with with uh, the modern day equivalent of Adolf Hitler, and and some very strong remarks from the Polish uh, side, uh, and you mentioned the issue of the you know the the MiG-29 fighters, I think about 29 sorry 25 uh, Polish uh, fighters. Uh, the, the Biden administration has uh, has declined to cooperate with Poland in sending these and has declined to backfill uh, the loss of fighter aircraft for the Poles if, if the, uh, the fighters are sent over uh, to, to Ukraine on the grounds that this would, you know, escalate tensions mm -hmm. with Russia, as though you could escalate tensions any, any further considering what the Russians have done. Um, and the Biden administration's decision here has come under very heavy fire uh, in, in Washington, overwhelmingly from, uh, from conservatives, but also from some within the Democratic uh, Party as well. And this brings me over to uh, another major foreign policy issue at the moment. In fact, I describe it as the, the second biggest foreign policy uh, sort of immediate matter right now for discussion, which is the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, and uh, the Biden presidency has come under uh, you know, tremendous uh, uh, condemnation over its decision to, to plow forward 
with, um, with getting a deal with Iran while partnering with Russia. Uh, and Republicans have heavily criticized this approach from the Biden administration, but also some within Biden's own party have been very critical of this. And of course, if a deal were to be put to the Senate uh, to be approved, it would be overwhelmingly rejected by the US Senate. And so there's no prospect mm -hmm. that this deal would be put forward as a treaty before the, the Senate, uh, and it would be overwhelmingly defeated. Um, could you talk about what's happening in London with regard to the Iran nuclear deal? Of course, the UK is a signatory to the original Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA. Uh, there is growing opposition within the Conservative Party publicly to doing a deal with Iran and this idea of partnering with Russia. Uh, uh, Lord Frost had a very uh, powerful piece in the Telegraph over the weekend on this issue. You've also had uh, a number of uh, Conservative members of Parliament who have been very outspoken, uh, urging uh, Boris Johnson to, uh, to uh, avoid doing a deal with, with Russia and avoid partnering, sorry, avoid doing a deal with Iran and avoid partnering with the Russians on this. Uh, and uh, could you talk a bit about what was happening within the Conservative Party on this? Is there a possibility that the Prime Minister could reverse course on this and reject the idea of doing a, a deal with Iran, the world's biggest state sponsor of terror? Yeah, there are complex issues around this. You're referring to the JCPOA, I think, which uh, America declined to sign. I've always had misgivings about it. I've had misgivings because um, we, we cannot say for certain what Iran is doing with regards to preparing itself to create nuclear weapons. In fact, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the war in Ukraine, the one thing that I think will be screaming loud and clear at all these other states like Iran and North Korea is that if you want to deter the West, you need to have a nuclear weapon. Uh, and, uh, you know, nu nuclear deterrence was always about this ability that you recognize each other might well use it, in which case you don't want to get to that point. And during the Cold War, it worked because the Soviet Union believed there was always a genuine chance that the, the West, particularly the US, would, uh, would be prepared to use these weapons. And hence, as I referred to 1983, I think it was, uh, those decisions of strength meant deterrence worked. Intriguingly, it does look like deterrence has reversed itself on us now, and that Russia's early uh, and quite carefully stage-managed threat of nuclear weapons has, um, has worried a lot of policymakers, both here and in Europe, uh, about how far they go with regards to supporting Ukraine, and you mentioned earlier on, uh, the jets, etc. I think that one is caught up in that that perceived threat, and I think I think it's a mistake uh, to confuse those issues together. So, in, request, in 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 answer to your first question, which was about the jets, I think that I hope the U.S. government will rethink their position. I think uh, the, the 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 Polish government is right. I think that there is uh, every reason why, if Zelensky wants these jets, he should have them. After all, in peacetime, he would have bought these things anyway from anybody. They are not a major escalation or an escalation at all, really, because uh, why should it be okay for Russia to bomb, uh, use their jets to bomb uh, civilians in Mariupol and elsewhere, but not all right for the Ukraine to try and defend itself and to attack uh, the Russian uh, artillery that is actually bombing their, uh, that is shelling and bombing their, and jets that are shelling and bombing their people. So the logic there, I think, needs to be separated out from uh, the nuclear threat. Uh, that was clearly an attempt to stop us doing almost anything. We should recognize that, uh, uh, that that shouldn't stop us doing anything at all, and this is the right thing to do. On the, on the JCPOA, as I started referring to it, I, I do genuinely hope that the government will rethink this. We cannot know what they get up to. And I said earlier on, we should treat with nations as they are, not as we wish they would be. That is our biggest failing in the West, is that we always want to believe somehow that they will change. Uh, we should prepare for the fact that they won't change, and everything else is a bonus. So with Iran, we see no evidence of this totalitarian uh, state changing in any way at all. It supports terrorism all over the Middle East. Uh, it's particularly dangerous and threatening to Israel, uh, but to other nations too. Uh, and it could be the forerunner of another global war 
uh, because of the position it takes uh, in alliance with states like China. So my answer is really that anything that looks and has the slightest possibility of increasing their potency is a bad move. And I think, therefore, we should rethink this. And just because we do need more oil on the markets, that shouldn't be a persuading factor at all. The truth is, Iran is a dangerous and threatening nation, and we should treat it like that. Uh, absolutely very, very well said. Uh, and uh, on the issue of you know, US leadership on the world stage, especially in the wake of the, the disastrous uh, Afghanistan uh, withdrawal, um, also uh, a lot of concern as well about the, you know, the Biden presidency's handling of the uh, ahead of the Russian invasion of, of, of Ukraine. And many in Washington uh, believe that the Biden White House should have been a lot tougher in terms of deterrence against the Russians. Uh, the British moved a lot earlier in terms of proactive action uh, well ahead of the, the Russian invasion. Um, there is a sense uh, among many uh, critics of the Biden administration in, uh, here in Washington, including on Capitol Hill, that the Biden administration moved too slowly. The president has not been moving fast enough. And even now, uh, there is a sense that uh, you know, the sanctions put in place are not tough enough, more needs to be done. Um, could you talk a bit about you know, the, the vital importance of US leadership on the world stage and, and the need for the United States to, to really be seen to be leading and, and taking action um, and, uh, and taking a more proactive approach? Yeah, I, <clears throat> forgive me if I don't uh, get too marred in the domestic politics of this because it's uh, be wrong of me to do so, but I will say that um, there's no question that the US still absolutely has a, has a leading role. I mean, the US is the most powerful nation on the planet. Uh, I hope it remains so. Uh, and uh, it's important, therefore, as, a, as the, the biggest, in a sense, uh, the greatest, most potent democracy and believer in freedom, uh, that it is important for that leadership to be maintained. Uh, just because the Cold War ended didn't mean that the role of the US should end with it. The role of the U.S. is still much the same. And now, as we discover, actually, that there was a brief interlude between different bits of the Cold War, uh, that leadership role is vital as well. And I think, um, I think, therefore, and I hope that that will be maintained. Uh, it's certainly, in the case of Ukraine, I know that the U.K. has worked very closely with the U.S. Uh, to do that. And uh, the U.K. was early in on this one. But I think that uh, that ho hope, is, I believe, has encouraged the... US to, <clears throat> to do the same as well. Um, my concern remains hugely with uh, countries in Europe uh, at the moment, though, because, as you said, the Polish leader was concerned about President Macron's role in this. And I do wish that we wouldn't get much more of this idea somehow, as I said earlier, of the off-ramp. So if the US leadership can do anything at all, it should be telling, <clears throat> and I thought that President Biden sort of got towards there, it should be telling um, uh, the Russians categorically that uh, they must get out of Ukraine, lock, stock, and barrel. Uh, otherwise, there will not be an end to the war. Uh, and there is no <clears throat> halfway house any longer on this. And so I would love the US government to lead specifically on that clear, unequivocal message to the Russians uh, that this is not going to end well for them. Uh, very well said. And. Uh... Uh, switching uh, gears to um, to the Northern Ireland issue, of course, an issue of, of um, tremendous importance for uh, for the United Kingdom, uh, and uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol is a uh, is the main, the number one issue of contention right now between London and Brussels, uh, and active discussions taking place. Um, uh, as, as we speak on this on this matter, and, and growing calls among British Conservatives for the British government to invoke the uh, uh, the Northern Ireland um, uh, uh, protocol here. Um, what what do you think um, will be the the Prime Minister's approach with regard to uh, to the situation in Northern Ireland and the negotiations with with the European Union? Uh, do do you expect a, a toughening of the, of the British uh, position here? Uh, right now, of course, the, the status quo with regard to Northern Ireland is, is viewed as, as unacceptable by 
uh, by, uh, by most British, uh, British conservatives treating Northern Ireland differently to the rest of the United Kingdom, uh, a state of affairs which is, which is unsustainable and seen as very unjust. Uh, could, could you talk about, about this? Yes, I, probably a bit complex sometimes for lots of people to understand, but the Northern Ireland Protocol was agreed at the final days because it was the only way we could <clears throat> break the logjam and uh, for the UK to deliver on the 2016 referendum, which was to leave the European Union. It was, as you can recall, <coughs> the, the politics was in f turmoil in the UK as a result of the failure to have done that. Uh, um, <coughs> Boris Johnson agreed to this. It was a halfway house. It was never seen as a permanent solution. <coughs> it, um, it basically arranged to put the border, believe it or not, between the Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom to maintain what they call the open border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. Now, <clears throat> the problem with all of that is it's, it was meant to be, and I think the US government understood that uh, to be the reason why, and the European Union said it was. The reason was to protect the Good Friday Agreement. That is to say that both sides had a balance and that they shouldn't disrupt that balance <clears throat> by erecting a border in Northern Ireland. Well, the truth is nobody's ever threatened in the UK to erect a border in Northern Ireland, come what may. Uh, we wouldn't do it, even if this all broke down. The only people that have threatened to erect a border in, the in, Northern, in Ireland have been the EU, <laughs> ironically, who threatened if we invoked Article 16, which basically stops what's going on and forces everybody back to the table, uh, that uh, they'd be likely to impose a border in, uh, against Northern Ireland and Europe. We're in, we, we've never... We've never argued for that, and we wouldn't do it no matter what state the negotiations and discussions are in. No, there is a way through this, and here I would hope the U.S. government would recognize that if the purpose was to defend the Good Friday Agreement, this protocol is destroying it right now. It's creating, creating a real schism between uh, uh, the unionists and the nationalists in Northern Ireland, and this could lead to serious problems. So, you know, I served out there many years ago. I was the last person who wants this thing to erupt into any sort of uh, uh, furtherance of those troubles. So there is a way to do this. The, uh, the protocol itself has two particular articles in it. One is Article 16, which allows one of the parties, if they believe this is not working, to suspend the arrangement uh, and then uh, go into further negotiation. The other, which is not really spoken of much, uh, which is uh, Article 13.8. I sound a little bit of a nerd, I know, when I do this now. But 13.8 actually very clearly indicates that the protocol is not permanent and that it can, at mutual in in agreement, be suspended, got rid of at any time. So if you think about that, and if you have an alternative, then surely we should be discussing the alternative. We do have an alternative. The paper that I and many others have worked on and produced, which is called Mutual Enforcement, basically it means, look, we each, on either side of the border, uh, with the European Union, we each take responsibility for the enforcement of each other's regulation. So if goods cross the border into Northern Ireland that shouldn't, from Northern Ireland into Ireland itself, that shouldn't have done because they didn't comply with EU regulations, then uh, it is the UK that will enforce that and prosecute those who send them across, and vice versa for the European Union. It means you don't have a border, but it also means you don't then need to have ludicrous checks going on between uh, the mainland of the UK and Northern Ireland. And that is the key. And if you want to restore that stable environment, then that is the way ahead and we sh the European Union should now meet. And I hope that all of this stuff with Ukraine will show the, U the European Union that they should stop being angry about the fact that the UK has left the EU and stop trying to make it certain that somehow this would damage the UK as a lesson to others. Uh, that's not a reality. The reality is as they can see, that the UK will continue to work closely with the European Union and countries in the European Union because that is the nature of it. We hold no spite or difference on that. But if that is the case, and as we've seen in the run to the Ukraine settlement and the problems in that, where the UK has led and helped organize this, then now I think the EU should take a pace back and ask themselves, why wouldn't we want to discuss something like that and sort this out rather than sit on uh, the fact that this was an agreement agreed it does have let outs, and the European Union should be positive and reasonable about it, and I hope they will be. Uh, and um, Nancy Pelosi, uh, Speaker of the House, has, has been very outspoken on this particular issue. Yeah. Um, and <coughs> she has 
uh, issued what could only be described as, as you know, threats to the UK over US-UK trade agreements, saying that if there is any uh, effort by the British to undermine the Good Friday Agreement, is, is her line, then there'll be no US-UK uh, trade deal. And that strikes me, of course, as a, uh, as a complete sort of misrepresentation of where the British government's position is on this. Could, could you address what she has been saying? Well, I'd, be very, I'd love to speak to her, I'd sit down with her quietly and go through what I think are the issues and the problems and how it can be settled. It is wholly reasonable to want to settle this. The reality, as I said earlier on, is that the Good Friday Agreement is now under threat from this very protocol. Uh, and anybody that knows anything knows that to be the case. You cannot allow something to favour one side and not the other. That was the whole point of the Good Friday Agreement. So um, finding a way to resolve that while still keeping the border open is critical. Uh, and that we agree with. And so there are arrangements that can be made. Uh, and it requires, I think, uh, the European Union to decide that they're prepared to discuss what is enshrined in Article 13.8, which is the replacement of this existing protocol with something better that works. That requires, I think, common purpose. It also requires common sense in the sense that um, it, it means a compromise on both sides. And I'm, I think that is wholly feasible. So I'd be very happy to talk to her or anybody else uh, that wants to know what that phrase shouldn't do anything to damage the Good Friday Agreement, actually means we all signed up to it, we all agree with it, uh, and I am as determined as anybody in my own country to make sure that that doesn't happen. But to do that, this is not the way. This is actually acting in quite the opposite way. And I think the problem is that, uh, you know, sometimes when things are wrong, you need to think about replacing them. Exactly. And, and do you remain hopeful for the prospects of a US-UK uh, free trade agreement, uh, a deal between the world's largest and fifth largest economies. There were several rounds of negotiations under the Trump presidency. Uh, things have slowed down a lot, of course, under the Biden administration, although um, uh, recent talks have, um, you know, have sort of kick-started the process again. Um, do, do you, w what's your view about the, the outlook for a U.S.-U.K. trade deal? Well, I, you know, it's logical and it makes sense. <laughs> the U.S. is still our largest trading partner. Uh, the whole time we were in the EU, we traded more outside the EU than we did inside the EU, which is a peculiarity of the UK. Uh, even Switzerland, which wasn't inside the EU, traded more with the EU uh, in proportionate terms than we did. So uh, America is always a vital market for us, vice versa, from financial services right the way through things like medical technologies and into all the other goods and services that exist. So it would make common sense for the two countries to arrive at some kind of common purpose uh, because uh, not only does it represent the trade benefits uh, for both sides, but it also represents uh, a further development and strengthening of uh, that alliance that we hold, or I certainly and others hold, so dear. And so um, I don't think these things should be linked. I think these things should be delinked, and they should be about sense and what benefits both of us. And trade normally benefits both of us. It is a fact that free trade, as a general rule around the world, has reduced poverty faster than any other uh, mechanism that I know of. Uh, and so, you know, this would help both sides, I think. Uh, we both uh, complement each other. So I would hope that we will get on with that and discuss them. And I know the uh, Trade Secretary in the UK is working towards that. And I hope this administration sees it as an important uh, tool of, of what they wish to do. And I therefore would encourage it. Excellent. And uh, one uh, last question about the, the future of the, the Conservative Party. And uh, you, you've been in, in Parliament now for several, for several decades. Um, you've been one of the most influential figures, I think, in the, the Conservative Party in recent history, and also uh, someone who has a direct ear of the, uh, of, of the Prime Minister. Um, do, do you think the, the Prime Minister is, is committed to taking the, the party back to a sort of more Thatcherite path in terms of his overall big picture uh, vision with, with uh, you know, reduced government spending, lower taxes, uh, a reduced role for the, uh, for the state? Um, do, do you think that, that is where the Conservative Party is, uh, is headed in the, uh, in the coming years? Yeah, I, something about Mrs. Thatcher is really important, or Lady Thatcher, as she later became, um, a remarkable, she was just obviously a remarkable woman, a, a remarkable prime minister, a remarkable global leader. She broke uh, all the views of how things should be done and changed them. And with, of course, Ronald Reagan here, it was uh, probably one of the great alliances 
that will have changed uh, the way that we live our lives and many senses changed history. Uh, now, that notwithstanding, she was a woman of her time. And there is a tendency sometimes to, uh, to try and lift lock, stock and barrel what Mrs. Thatcher was confronting and bring them here uh, and do them through. I think the principles is what we're really after. Uh, this strong belief in freedom and the strong belief that individuals, people, are the best defenders of their home, their hearth, and their money, uh, and that uh, they are also the best people to decide what should be spent on them and how it should be spent, rather than big government. And so those principles, if we take them forward, are very much where we are today. Now, we have a major crisis facing us, and I think this is the biggest threat, which is, I think, a threat of stagflation. I think the West is now facing a serious problem, what with the combination of the energy crisis, which anyway was mounting, because of the uh, uh, this terrible lock set of lockdowns around the world. Now, suddenly, as people come out, the demand for energy is huge, and uh, supply isn't going to meet it. In the meantime, all the uh, attacks on companies that have, have uh, prospected for oil and gas have, been, have reduced their capability and their desire to, to extend their search for that and to produce it. So all of that has mounted. Uh, at the same time as then the war with Ukraine, etc., which means supplies of those are even more under threat. So, so that has led to a spike, a really serious spike in inflation, which has risen very high here and to a slightly lesser extent, but no less high in the UK. My concern right now in the immediate future is that we do learn a lesson from her, which is you deal with what's in front of you, not where you wish to be. What is in front of us right now is a serious threat uh, of uh, too much fiscal tightening. Uh, and I think governments beware, uh, and my own government beware, I've already said this earlier. We do need lower taxes right now because we need to keep, let people keep their own money to navigate their way through this whilst keeping growth going in the economy. That is a lesson that she learnt when they cut upper and lower rate taxation under Nigel Lawson, uh, and that completely released the economy. The second thing is that lower taxes produce higher receipts. That was the, the bit that means you get the money that you need, but not by taxing more, but by taxing less. And finally, it is important, of course, to make sure that you don't spend more than you earn. And so that means good housekeeping uh, at home within government. We have got in the habit of spending a great deal of money during the course of the pandemic. Some of that may have been necessary, but I think we need now to find ways to tighten up on governmental spending. But right now, the key issue, uh, which I think Mrs. Thatcher would have faced, is that the threat right in front of us is we end up, as we did in the 1970s, with a spiraling set of inflation figures and a dead set of economies, uh, which will put people out of work and they'll have even less money to spend. So growth is critical at the moment uh, as the immediate priority then followed by very good housekeeping to try and tidy up. But lower taxes certainly is as important today as it was when she was around. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Thiril. I think a message that um, Lady Thatcher would have heartily uh, <laughs> approved of and agreed with. Uh, and uh, it's been a, a tremendous wide-ranging uh, discussion this morning. Most grateful to you for joining us here in Washington, DC. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's, uh, who's joined us here in person, but also uh, our, our viewers online on both sides of the, of the Atlantic. And uh, uh, so Ian, we hope you have a, an extremely uh, productive visit here in Washington. I know you have a lot of uh, important meetings on, on Capitol Hill during your time uh, here. Uh, and uh, we wish you all the best as well with your, with your leadership in, in London at this critically uh, important uh, time on the, on the international stage. And we hope that we can welcome you back here uh, in Washington uh, later on this, this year, hopefully. So, so thank you very much, Sarian Dung Smith, for joining us today. It's been a, it's been a wonderful discussion. Uh, and thank you, everybody, t for joining us uh, today as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.